I'm glad I noticed anyway at some point. So, um, all right. So let's carry on with these slides here and talk about network signatures, which is here. There we are. Okay. I don't know why this thing is not listening to me. All right. And there. All right. So uh, we all know the standard ways you protect yourself on the network. Uh, with firewalls and routers, uh, old-fashioned gen generation one firewalls from 20 years ago would actually filter my IP address and port number. Now they're all layer seven, and they look at the whole URL and the protocols. So they can block things like BitTorrent and games and stuff. And then, of course, you can have DNS servers to protect you. If you use OpenDNS or one of the many other DNS services to protect you, then it has an intelligent analysis of DNS, and it decides if that DNS request is bad. This is why people got mad at Microsoft over Windows 10. Every URL you go to is sent to the Microsoft servers. They can decide if it is a known malicious URL, and then they will block you from going there, which is what OpenDNS would do, and most antivirus products will do this. This is a very common way to protect you. And there are various ways to do it. Uh, OpenDNS will actually redirect you to a page that says, this website has been blocked by your security policy. Other people will just throw them in a sync holder so you don't get any resolution for that DNS, and then you'll get an error message accomplishing the same thing. And uh, then you can have proxy servers are the main way to actually stop people from going to forbidden websites where they are not allowed to make any direct connections to any web service at all. They have to always go through your proxy, and your proxy refuses to fetch forbidden pages. This is the best way to really block things, so then people really can't get anywhere unless they can get to a VPN or something. So anyway, um, deep packet inspection is what you have with all modern protection defenses like Palo Alto firewalls, IDSs, which in principle only detect bad traffic and don't block it, and IPSs that block it, um, and email and web proxies. So if you have, if you're trying to do instant response, and you have an infected system, uh, what they is recommended is to analyze the traffic before you take the sample and put it in another environment because uh, quite a bit of it is intelligent enough not to run outside of its original environment. This is um, not that common, at least until recently, for Windows malware, but it is universal for Android malware. That's why if you take an Android malware class, you have to have a real device. It will not run in a simulator. They're all onto that. Anyway, um, so you get logs and alerts and packet captures from the malware in its original location if you want the most accurate stuff. And that's, of course, the most accurate. So you'll get real traffic about the real communication with the command and control server and the real protocols coming back. Um, and if you just passively record real traffic from a real infected machine, then there will be no way for the attacker to know you're doing that. If you do it correctly, which is you configure a sniffer on a network tap at layer two, so your sniffer does not have an IP address at all. It just gets a, a layer two MAC address. It gets a copy of the packets sent on by the switch. And so there is no way for the external attacker to ever know it's there. That's what you should do. A question yeah. on that. So yeah. the malware, if it's resident in the network, how does it sense in 12? Because how does malware that you, you have in the Isolated environment, no, it's, you know, in the lab environment. Well, in a lab environment, if you are an American company, you typically infect a virtual machine and you just let it phone home to the real command and control server. The Germans were horrified when they heard this. They use INET SIM, they use a simulated internet, so it doesn't actually get to the normal command and control server. So they get less precise measurements, but it is safer. But what most American companies just do is sure, fine, it's going to virtually let it get infected. What's one more bot? We just want to see what it will do. And the problem is then, of course, your network will be put on blacklists as having infected machines on it and stuff. It's, it's arguably sort of sleazy and sloppy, but it's the fastest way to get the answer in, in practice. It, if you're only willing to accept a small amount of collateral damage, it's the most efficient procedure. So that's the American way. Anyway, so you can see things out here. You'll see domains resolved, IP addresses, get requests going out to it. And here you see a get request with a strange user agent, WEFA7E, -E, the kind of thing you'll see. Um, something goofy about a request that is not really a real request coming from a browser, but is some kind of fake request. Um, and so the point is you want to run OPSEC so you don't get caught. Um, if you are 
analyzing mass malware with millions of copies going to the same everybody, then that's what antivirus can stop. And then you're there's no real risk. But typically what you're doing here is you're looking at um, advanced persistent threats, actors that have targeted you specifically and they're sending custom malware to each person. And therefore they are investing time to infect you and keep ownership there. And you, they're watching to see if you detect them. So you don't want to let them know you've detected them. So they need operational security. And so they'll send a spear phishing email, but all the spear phishing emails are different. The links have a different item in the URL so they know who did it. And they'll know if it actually clicked on some location other than the right geographic area. Uh, the exploit might log the infections and they can also do what um, Thinks Canary will do on the defensive side. They can put domains in the malware that are not actually used. So that when you run strings and then you start looking up those domains and trying to scan them and stuff, they're going to know you're onto them. This is what Thinks Canary lets you do defensively. Thinks Canary will let you put hardware devices on your network that look like web servers or something, and it'll also let you put email addresses and URLs on your network in places that are not actually used so that when bad guys steal your stuff and use it, you'll know. The fact that somebody went there means somebody stole my data. It's a very good idea, and they use it the other way too. Um, so if you want to avoid getting caught by these things, then you have to use indirection tactics. You can use things like Tor so that they can't tell where you are. Now, of course, they can still tell you're coming from Tor, so that might shut you off. Use a dedicated VM with a different internet connections to make it different. Use a cloud machine. This is big for attackers, red teamers, blue teamers. Everybody puts everything in the cloud. Malware in the cloud, Amazon or, or Google uh, cloud services. Um, that's the way I do everything these days. That's the way everybody does everything. Whether you're a good guy or a bad guy, it turns out to just be awesome to put everything in the cloud. Um, oh, well, that's right. Yeah, you can look at it that way. Yeah, anyway. Okay. It's a matter of perspective. That's, that's, Any, that's fine. Anyway, so then you, know, you could go to a search engine to Google like the domain to see what other people are saying about the domain. And that might seem good, but if you go to like the Google cache and view the cached copy of a page, that is not safe. I was very annoyed when I found this out. If you go to a page and you go to the Google cache, you see the code and the code does not come directly from that server. But the images and stuff in that code still resolve on the real server. So when you view a Google cached page of domain.com, your browser is still making requests to domain.com. Very rude. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. As far as I know, the Wayback Machine is completely cached and doesn't make any live requests to the real server, but I have not tested it. It would be something to test. Um, the Wayback Machine is archives of the internet that goes back for years, and they have copies of pages the way they used to look. And so I think those are totally cached locally and do not rely on any current requests, but they don't really plan for that. They're not thinking about it as an OPSEC tool. So it might accidentally still make some kind of request back to the server. Clearly, they don't really want that because they only want to show you what used to be there. It shouldn't even matter what's currently there. But, you know, they didn't really design it with OPSEC in mind, so I wouldn't assume they went to any great effort to prevent that. Yes, and, and the pages are not complete. They don't have the download links or anything, but they took pages that were considered popular at the time and archived them so you can look at what things used to look like. And you can see domains that are gone, that have been erased and gone down. You can go back to an earlier time and see them before they went down. If, but, it, was if it was archived. But the only archive like at random time is like every few months or something. So you, you might find what you want there, but often you'll find that they didn't archive that page at the right time. Day and not for a year. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what algorithm they use, and I suppose it's changed many times. I saw the Wayback Machine uh, when I went to a bind training in IPv6 at ISC down in Redwood City. They took us in and showed us the Internet Archive. They went to their server room, and it was like three machines on a rack. It was really. They said that's the whole thing. That's all the storage. That's all the servers. It's just you know this big. <laughs> Now it's in San Francisco, and they take volunteers, and they have tours and everything. I've contacted a few times saying if they should come to the job fair and take interns, but I can never get anybody to talk to me. But they're around, and they're highly respected, and they have public events and stuff. So uh, if somebody wants to hang out there and find out what's up, we could probably start placing student interns there. I think we're going to have to make a 
personal community connection with them, though I haven't been able to reach anybody online effectively. Um, anyway, so um, DNS records are enormously useful. Many, mm -hmm. A bunch of paid services, uh, the most famous one I hear about these days is Recorded Future, um, that analyze DNS records and collect them because you can find out what's going on by analyzing DNS records. You can find out where domains used to be, you can find out what other domains are sharing the same IP address, you can find out who owned the previous domains, and this is how they caught a lot of online criminals, because there was an earlier time, like years ago, when they used their real name in a registration. Then they went to a life of crime and put in fake name, but there's still a trail, the same IP address, similar domain name that you can follow back. So. Uh, these records are quite valuable. Now you can get current lookups with things like who is, but what's more useful is to have an archive of historical lookups. And there are a bunch of websites that have that, although most of them are not free. And um, so who is and dig show you what's up there now, but technically they may expose your IP address, although they should only be asking your ISP, but you're, um, and there are websites you can go to that will do it for you, where it will do a dig and therefore the traffic should not be coming directly from you. All right, and there's other ones like Rob Text. This is one of the many services that will find out what other servers are on the same machine, the same IP address, which will often help you because scammers usually run like 100 scam websites on the same machine. And even if yours looks okay, the others are thing like, you know, Viagra for cheap or something obviously spammy, and you can tell they're bad guys. And they'll also go look for the main public blacklists. There are several huge public blacklists which are used by email servers to make sure they're not delivering email to bad domains. And the thing that happens is once you're on that list, it's hard to get off. I keep getting on them and then getting removed. There's amateurs keep flagging my site as a malicious site and then other people take it down. So every few days people say, I can't get your page, my firewall, my is blocking it. And then a few days later it's better. You know, Cause I guess I'm dangerous and edgy. Anyway, so uh, um, here's what I did. I looked up 147. 1.0 City College domain and found a whole bunch of City College machines on there. So you can go to Rob Text and it will scan the domain in its archive of DNS records to tell you all the machines that had a DNS record pointing there. Most of these machines are no longer still up, but at some time there was some server using that public address. Anyway, then there's DNS loggers. This is passive DNS monitoring. I just heard a very good podcast from a guy that did this at UK. Um, there were two people in the UK government that were given the job of securing the internet in the United Kingdom with no instructions at all. So he said, uh, what do we do? He said, I don't know. We're not sure. Do whatever you think is good. So they started just recording passive DNS lookups and recording all the domain names people went to, and they found all the malicious domains, and they started taking them down. I've done this myself, actually. Um, if you contact a um, hosting provider, and you say, take down this domain, they said, some of them said, well, you need a court order. And they said, no, we don't need a court order, which you totally don't. They're violating your terms of service. I don't need a court order. And in fact, what they found is the companies like ICANN that hand out domains, in fact, have a generic agreement. When you purchase a domain, you do have a generic agreement, which says I'm not going to put criminal sites on there so that uh, you don't need a court order or anything. They've already agreed to something. They were able to just sort of convince people to take them down until they were taking down tens of thousands of domains per year. Um, so it's anyway, it can be done. I did it a few times. So I got a few cahoots here, but the UK government paid these guys to do it for years and, uh, they were pretty successful at it. I just tried doing a few that were doing things like phishing city college emails and passwords and stuff. But, um, aha. Uh -huh. Different music, perhaps? Christmas music? I'm not sure. Perhaps it's Christmas music. Well, I think it's definitely different music, so that's nice. Yeah. You also animated the winning field. You don't know, you're clearly, someone's investing money into this thing. They're also uh, begging for me to pay for it a little bit more vigorously than in the past, which I'm not doing, but still. When I use it, they keep popping up pages saying, you want to pay for it? You want to pay for it? How about you pay for it? But at the bottom, there's a little, no thanks. But, you know, one of these days, they're going to like make you pay for it. <laughs> But I haven't done it yet. So. 
It's a good service, though, and they deserve to get paid something. I'm just cruel and heartless. Maybe I'll relent at some point. All right. We'll get a few more seconds to see if we got any more victims. Anybody in the room still going in? All right. Let's see what they've got here. So, which one will log attacks but not stop them? Okay, that's intrusion detection system. All right. And which one will redirect trap domains to a sinkhole? That's your DNS server. Nobody else would do it. The router won't do it. I do that with, um, with ad servers. Yeah, but not in the router. Not in the router, no. Yeah, not in the router. Yes, that's true. A lot of people do, yeah. <laughs> All right, you know the Raspberry Pi too. All right, so which device filters traffic based on packet headers, or at least it used to? Oh, okay, this one still does, fair enough. That's right, routers can do packet filtering, which is the first generation firewall. They can just throw away packets based on header information. This is the primitive activity, which is hardly even worthy of being called a firewall, but routers can do that. All right. And which one of these will best conceal the location of a host? All right, that's Tor. Tor is a US military project, so spies can hide and deliberately designed to make it easy for content thieves to hide so that they will provide cover for the spies. So the main purpose of it is to hide your physical location and that's what it does. Um, where, what's the central point of administration for a bombing? Okay, command and control center, good, all right. So now we get the glorious animation. Not a palindrome, that's not exactly helpful. And credit card, all right, people. <laughs> I don't know who I give points to. Vin might be a real name, okay. So Vin gets points. The rest of them will have to come out of the closet. She's, you're one of them? Credit card, oh, that's your credit card scanner? Oh, yeah, the credit card scanner. Oh, good, good, well, that's totally. You know, I, I went to DEF CON and uh, Major Malfunction was there and he had a, Read write head from a cassette tape driver, masking tape attached to a pen, going into the sound card of a laptop, and he cloned an audience member's credit card right there on stage. It was bloody awesome. That's all you need, a magnetic read write head. And he took like a BART ticket, and he put somebody else's credit card on it and had a credit card that worked. So anyway, so you, this is there for Caitlin. And I don't know who these other people are, but if, if palindrome comes out of the closet, they can get their points. Other than that, they can uh, ignore it if they so choose. There are some people who already have enough points, they don't care. So, um, all right, so then you kind of content based uh, countermeasures. Snort is the standard. Snort, when this thing came out like 25 years ago, people thought, that's it, we're going to solve security. This will fix everything. And of course, it wasn't that great, but it is pretty great. So, it has, it can just take a expression and perform like a grep on the network packet and look for any pattern of data anywhere in the packet and decide whether to take it or not. And so you write these goofy looking rules that have a message to put in the log when it finds one and then some clue with basically a grep thing to tell it um, what it's looking for. This is looking for uh, carriage return, line feed, user agent, we FA7E. So it's looking for anything that contains that string in it and that makes it part of the botnet which is fine. Um, and there's a real art to writing these rules. You have to, like a uh, most grep rule, you can write a really complicated rule and then it really slows down the whole thing. So making a rule that stops the bad stuff and doesn't have false positives and doesn't slow down your filter machine too much is quite an art. So um, you know, this one here, if you run the malware several times, you see the URL is not always, the, the host, the user agent is not always the same. It always seems to start with W-E, but then it has some random characters. 
So um, you might need a smarter rule to catch them all. So anyway, um, you can do dynamic analysis to see what real infected machines do and use something like INET SIM to, uh, or you can try and send it packets to drive the malware down special places. You can do static analysis of the code. Um, there's lots of ways to try to find out what malware will do under all conditions. Um, there are examples we've been through in the malware analysis class where there's the real examples where there are bots that will infect you and then they will do something like look at the language on your machine to decide whether to really do a bad thing or not. This is very common of Russian malware because the Russian government will protect you if you sell hacking products openly, they will totally protect you as long as you do not attack targets inside Russia, then they'll arrest you. So a lot of people know to write their stuff so it will not attack people inside Russia. And of course, all the military malware, like Chinese government will not protect ones inside China and so on. So it is a routine activity that it has a target detection phase that decides whether to be malicious or not. And so if you run it in your virtual machine environment, it might not detect that as a target and then you won't see the real malicious activity. So um, you can spend a lot of time analyzing, like to analyze all of the code. You almost never need that. It's usually a lot easier to just um, get close enough where you understand the communication method in enough detail to write signatures. Um, you have to define your goals. Knowing everything about malware is probably not what you want. You probably just want to know how to detect it, how to pick up, um, how to clean it off, and how to figure out what damage it did to your version. That's all you really want. So anyway, it'll typically communicate by making fake traffic looks like real traffic. It will look like HTTPS or HTTP or DNS, but it's not really. And then they have a server at the other end that receives that stuff and sends a response. So typically, the general rule, at least at the time they wrote your book, was it used HTTP for beacon. These days, I wouldn't be surprised if it's moving to HTTPS because almost everybody is HTTPS now. So HTTP is probably not the best way to hide your traffic, but it's certainly easier because you don't have to handle a certificate or anything. Um, Anyway, so um, you can also send information with DNS requests. So you'll just send things like a get here, and the get will have something like a user agent full of a long string of base64. You can put encoded data anywhere in the request. And of course, that is not something a normal browser would make, but it will pass through the firewall, and it will not be logged as like suspicious traffic or anything. So this is a common way you send commands from the command and control server and stolen data back from the client and so on. and. Uh, you can, so a lot of malware use strings, user agent strings that were predictable, things like back orifice and stuff, so you could just look for it. Um, here's what a normal user agent looks like. It always has this stuff about which version of Mozilla it's compatible with and so on. But this, this malware here would have alternate between a few of these to defeat detection, so it looks like various old browsers. Um, um, another thing they'll do is have a real web server where you send a get request and it looks at some code to know you're a bot and then it sends a web page back that includes code hidden in like a comment tag. So your normal viewers will just see a web page. The malware will know that in there is my commands. So this one has this thing called add serve, which is the keyword. So you can detect it by watching for that. Um, Client-initiated beaconing is what you almost always have because everybody's behind network address translation and for that matter, Windows firewalls. So you cannot send unexpected traffic from the outside. You have to send it from the inside. So the infected machine phones home and that's what you'll see. Beacons going out, usually HTTP requests because everybody has to be able to surf the web. So all their firewalls and everything have to let them send HTTP requests out. So the beacons will go out as long as they can look like HTTP requests. So your beacon will look like this. It's getting a page and there's a long number in the URL, which is actually an encoded version of like the identifier of this machine for the bot and army. And that's the sort of thing you'll see. So I got some cahoots about that. This is B, all right. And everything looks good. Not divisible by T. All right. 
I, maybe everybody's in. Anybody still coming in? No screams of protest. Where would we go? So, a field in a request header. Okay, user agent, of course. Good. What technique makes it difficult to identify a bot from its IP address? Problem in that, many machines have the same address. All right, what protocol is most commonly used for beacons? HTTP, now I, I was thinking DNS might be better, but the fact is many organizations do not let you use external DNS servers. All DNS requests have to go to their local server, whereas HTTP has to go to the real destination. So it does make more sense to use it for the beacons. Anyway, all right, so we got winners. Let's see, McCacker. I'm guessing that's Caitlin again. <laughs> Good, okay. Not divisible by T. I don't know who that is. And Vin, all right, good, so. Good, then we're all right. Not Vin, not a palindrome, either the same person, but they're not getting their points unless they come out of the closet. Anyway, so, um, all right. So let's carry on here. All right, so here's uh, the internal Windows API calls. This is how Windows software works. You call functions. Now the original thing, all the internet came from Berkeley. Berkeley standard Unix is where it all started. This is what created the internet and they invented this stuff here. Sockets, connect, send and receive. That's the basic thing that used TCP IP to transmit data. And Microsoft ignored it for a long time and eventually got on board. Apple ignored it for a long time and eventually got on board. They had their LAN protocols and they didn't think the internet mattered. And so the first generation of internet connectivity was all just copying Unix source code and using Unix conventions. And that's what this stuff is. So that was the original WinSock API. This, was, this is the original raw internet called raw packets. And later on, as Windows decided to really get into the business of using the internet, they wrote their high level ones that would do like internet read file, internet write file, that, that is a higher level library. Either the WinIDET IPI or the COM interface has these higher level commands. And it's not expected for anybody to actually use raw sockets anymore. You know, it's a lot of extra programming, but it is an option available and malware authors often use it um, just to hide from normal developers who only know how to use this stuff and wouldn't waste their time with raw sockets down there. So you'd use normal malware, you use something like internet open and HTTP open request, and you then have to generate the URI. This semi-random number will be generated any way you make a random number, typically something like the, the clock, system clock or something is used to get a number that you can treat as a relatively random number. Um, so you can use hard-coded data, you can get information about the host, and whatever you have, keystrokes, various ways to get um, identifiers from the machine or random numbers. Um, if you use hard-coded data, then you've got a problem because then you're stuck with it. Once someone's infected, they already have a URL. This is what happened with WannaCry. WannaCry had a hard-coded string of the command and control server. So um, I think Marcus is the guy that found it in Britain and he turned off WannaCry by buying that domain. So that's the problem. If you have a hard coded command and control domain in your malware, then you can't change it when somebody takes over that machine, you're hosed. So anyway, um, so if, you're, if your author uses the low level network sockets, then they have to write the whole handshake protocol and the whole HTTPS request. And in that case, they're likely to make a mistake or not do it exactly the way a normal high level library will. And that will mean their network traffic will be distinguishable from normal network traffic created by real browsers that uses the easier high level protocols. So you make your, here's an example of the URI, you have random bytes and then the first three bytes of the host name and then the time, how you'd make that long semi-random number to try to identify a bot. So if you wanted to write a rule to find it, you could write a grep string that encodes that whole thing, four random bytes and then first three bytes of the host name and then the time. You could make a rule that looks for exactly that pattern, but if you did, it would be really slow to do all that work, but that's a signature. This is what a snort rule would look like with all that complexity in it. 
every location lists all the options of the numbers that can appear in that location. And technically, this will find that pattern, but it's not the smartest way to get the job done. So um, another thing that would be better, like we say, is look at this add serve thing. You're going to get a start comment mark, then add serve, then some random junk, and then the close comment mark. So you can write various rules that will look for that pattern. You look for the opener, the text, and then the close. This is how web parsers work. They find an opening comment. They know to ignore everything in between until the closing comment and not bother displaying any of it. So um, the malware has commands like sleep and so on, and it just has a base 64 translation and what it does. And so it's sending these commands in to the bot. And um, so you could, these are five possible commands. Um, and you could look for exactly those strings. And then you will only find it if this malware is sending exactly that command to the bot. But of course, if the malware changes in any way, it has a new command, you won't find it. So just looking for these five exact matches is probably not the smartest solution. Uh, you could have the more general one that will accept any kind of base 64 in the middle and find it. That's pretty good. Anyway, there's just various ways to do it. So you can see um, user agent and accept always appear together. So here was um, one with a user agent and an accept string, but no refer. And real browser traffic always has all the headers, whereas simulated traffic made by a programmer might skip a few headers. That would be an easy way to catch it. The al Qassam Cyber Army that brought down uh, American banks for about a year, about six or seven years ago, to punish them for a YouTube video insulting Mohammed, had a whole series of these mistakes. The earliest version would just send a GET request with about 100 capital A's in a row. So there were like 14 waves of attack, and the first few were incredibly primitive and easy to block. And every couple of weeks, there would be a new wave that was smarter. They were making it smarter and smarter and smarter. And if you went to the hacking conventions, there were secret talks where you could learn the right signatures to block it. All the banks paid security experts to keep writing smart rules and firewall rules to block the latest wave of attack. And they tried to keep it from being public knowledge because they didn't want the attackers to know they were onto them for as long as possible. So anyway, as the attackers, uh, the attacker has to write command and control code to live on the server, which they've also hacked and stolen. They don't really own the server. And then they have to write spreading malware that affects the targets. So if you understand what they're doing, you can choose a indicator of compromise that is intrinsic to their packets that they cannot change until they update both sides. That would be the best thing to do. Otherwise, you'll find that your indicator of compromise goes out of uh, become ineffective as soon as any update is made. So uh, you look for things like a user agent identifies bot traffic. Um, the server's looking for that to know it's a bot. The client has to put it out, so they can't really change it until they update both sides. Um, looking for other defects in the traffic are good. Um, and, you know, just like anything, the more you understand the process, the more likely you're going to succeed in writing a simple rule that runs fast and accurately detects the infections. Anyway, I've got one more Kahoot, and that's it for this stuff. Let's see anybody? No chats? Okay, good. All right, I'll give it another five seconds. Somebody still coming in? Come, aha, people are coming in. Okay, good. Oh, all right, I better read a little more. All right. All right, so which API has the internet open URL function? That's the WinINet, the one most people use for normal programming. All right, which is the lowest level API?
That's Windsock. There's this used to be this website called Two Cows, the Ultimate Collection of Windsock Software. And it was stuff using the Windows Socket Library. And I think it was the early generation of internet of, of network Windows programs, which I think were largely ported from Unix programs. But anyway, that's that was Windsock was the way to do networking for a while. All right. Which API forces the malware developer to write the most code? That's Winsock. If you've done the violent Python um, that I used to teach, you learn how to write raw sockets in Python, and it is pretty finicky. You have to write a bunch of junk, and you know, you can see why it's not very popular. All right. Have you ever, have you ever done com objects? Uh, a little bit, not very much. I've done a little multi-threaded stuff, but not much. Not there's, there's a lot of annoying <laughs> Oh, there is, yes. I got Louise and Ken Tan. And Ben, good. Yes, yes. Well, I, one thing I did, there was a, uh, a easy CTF had a challenge where you had a RSA key that was 1 million bits long to crack and I cracked it easily and then you had to decrypt the message after you found P and Q and the decryption was going to take eight days. So I spent time trying to write multi-threaded Python which did not help and then I found a faster Python library that made it got it down to like two days. So then I was able to do it wrong once and still had enough time to do it right once within the eight day duration of the contest. But um, you know, it was it was made from companion primes. That's about the only thing it could be. The P and Q were close together. So all you had to do was tie numbers near the square root. So the very first time I tried, I quickly found P and Q. But after that, the job wasn't over yet. There was another one in early generation of Pico CTF that was really annoying. You know Fibonacci numbers? You guys know this, right? If you, if you take Fibonacci numbers, you have like um, one and one, and then you add the last two to get the next one. So it's one plus one is two. Yeah, and two plus one is three, and three plus two is five, and five plus three is eight. So it goes up like this. But they said, suppose instead of adding the last two, you multiply the last two. You know what happens? It gets a lot bigger really, really fast. And they had another one like that too, where you take, I think, this one to the power of the one before it or something. Anyway, all you had to do was figure out like number 20 in one of those sequences. They said, this is going to be a test of your hardware. And they were not kidding. I couldn't find a computer anywhere that could handle those numbers at all. I spent a while trying to do it. They said, man, that sounds like a simple problem. You're going to find out. That's not a simple problem at all. And I found libraries. They said, Python can handle any number, no matter how big. So I tried to do it in Python, and man, in principle, Python can handle it. In practice, there was no hardware that would ever get there in any reasonable amount of time <laughs> that I could find. Anyway, uh, yeah, this is Fibonacci, but they, they made modifications to Fibonacci. The simple little modification makes it essentially impossible. There's another one. one of, when I was an undergraduate, one of my pals did the Ackermans number. And Ackerman's function is famous for recursive programming. And the way it works is something like this. It has two numbers. You have Ackerman's of ij. And the rule is to calculate Ackerman's of ij, that equals Ackerman's of i, Ackerman's of i, j minus 1, something like that. So you have to take one and then run it through the function to get the index for the next one. And he tried, to, he tried to figure out Ackerman of 5.5. Five. And this took like a whole day of processing on the fast computer available, a mainframe, to do it. It is designed to be very, very, very difficult to figure out, where the number of steps to get even up to a small place like that is enormously huge. If anybody wants to see it, this is a famous computer programming challenge, Ackerman's function. Used by, yeah, that's it, the Ackerman function. This is what you do to give people, it's an incredibly difficult problem that is very easy to express and very hard to calculate. Every step requires a geometric number of calculations of lower steps or something. So anyway, uh, all right. So I guess that's it. Um, I'll stop the recording and I'll stick around in the classroom for a while and see if anybody wants help here.